sitting is resumed. It is time for questions to the office of the First Minister and Deputy First Minister. We will start with 30 minutes of listed questions. And before I call Mr. Kieran McCarthy, can I tell members that question two has been withdrawn for a written answer? Mr. McCarthy. Kieran, I got last come call you. Question. Hayne. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question one. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, with your permission, I will ask Junior Minister Jennifer McCann to answer this question. Together, building a united community sets out a clear vision of how society here can move forward through greater interaction, mutual respect and social cohesion. The vision centres around four main themes on our children and young people, safety, sharing and cultural celebration. Within these themes, strategic projects focus on education, young people not in education, employment or training, regeneration and deprivation, housing and learning from the past. Significant progress has been made across all these areas and we expect to see projects being delivered on the ground early in the new year. The United Youth Programme has been progressed through an intensive co-design engagement with statutory community and voluntary organisations, and this will result in an event in January to finalise the design, which will then be passed to us for approval. We have approved a year-round intervention pilot, which will see the United Community Summer Schools and Camps being held in the summer of 2014, well ahead of the 2015 target. Building on existing good practice, officials are working with community representatives, the Department of Justice and statutory agencies to design a process to create the conditions that will allow interface barriers to be removed. The most recent workshop with community representatives was held on the 15th of November and we expect <coughs> to receive firm implementation proposals before Christmas, with work getting underway on the ground shortly afterwards. This is an executive strategy which will be delivered by a number of government departments. We are working with the Department of Education, the Department of Cultural Arts and Leisure and the Department for Social Development to progress the 10 shared education campuses, the cross-community sports programme and the 10 shared neighbourhoods and urban villages respectively. The relevant ministers will be bringing forward details of their progress on these three commitments to the ministerial panel which meets in December. Call Mr McCarthy for supplementary. I thank the junior minister for her response, but is uh, her department not grossly disappointed, if not entirely ashamed, to say that out of the uh, uh, number of uh, combined um, places that were identified, uh, only one at Lissanelli has been uh, talked about, and that uh, out of the 10 shared neighbourhood developments, uh, very little has uh, been done, and how soon and how quick can that be rectified? Well, can I just say to the member, I mean, the member has to appreciate that this is a, 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 a very um, large um, a, a project that we're, we're embarking on. And I think that really, you know, there has been some progress made. I've mentioned the, the seven key actions in my first answer. And there has been a substantive amount of progress made on some of those actions. Um, we hope to announce the urban villages soon. We have taken the United Youth Programme, which uh, um, has already, as I said, there's some of those, uh, the, the summer camps and the schools have been approved already. So there has been quite a lot of work done and the design groups um, have been working with, in collaboration with the community and voluntary sector as well, to take it forward. So I um, have to say, I, I think that I would disagree. I think there has been um, good work done and the work is still work in progress. Mr Mike Nesbitt. Uh, thank you, Deputy Chair. Thank the Junior Minister for her answers to date. Uh, six months on, as the question refers to, to Gather Building a United Community. Uh, can the Junior Minister tell us, is there now a defined budget, and if so, what is it? Well, can I just say to the Member, um, as I said, the, the design groups are working on the, the progress and, and what way that will be um, rolled out. Whenever you're talking about a budget, there is no definitive budget as such that, is, um, you know, that I could give you a ballpark figure. But what I will say is that the design groups are working, and they're working out with each, um, with each, each programme that's going to be implemented. There will be a budget attached to that, and we are working um, uh, to, to, get that, to get that rolled out. Um, again, I mean, we, we will be looking, when, when we're looking at a, a project as, as vast as this, we're going to be looking at existing budgets that are already there. There is already a substantive good relations budget that is rolled out by OFM to EFM. 
and there will be other budgets that will be, um, or sorry, other strategies that will be coming with this in terms of whatever the lead department is that's rolling it out. So I can't give you a ballpark figure, but certainly um, there is a, a substantive budget that's, that's already there, and that we will be adding to that as well. I call Mr. Declan Michael Lear. Uh, could the Minister give us an update on the United Youth Programme? Um, yes, it is essential that the United Youth Programme delivers the best possible outcomes for our young people, and there are many good examples across our society of programmes being delivered, and we want to learn from what works best. And I think it's important to reiterate that because what we're trying to do, we're trying to look at models of good practice that are already there when we're looking at other, other programmes and the implementation of other programmes. There are key stakeholders that have been written to with a series of questions to help them inform the design of the programme, and this has been followed up with one-to-one -one meetings. And I know there has been a number of meetings with um, organisations and stakeholders who would be particularly already working in this field, and there's going to be another meeting in January of, of those as well, which will, once that meeting takes place in January, with a design group, then we'd be rolling out the programme that, that's going to be uh, sort of that will be known as the United Youth Programme, but that's a work in progress as well. Call Mr. Colum Eastwood. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Junior Minister for her answers uh, thus far. Can I ask, in terms of the apprenticeship element of, of the project, um, can you tell me how many businesses uh, and other organisations have signed up so far? Sorry, is the member talking about the United Youth Programme? Well, in terms of the United Youth Programme, as I said, I mean, it's a fairly substantive programme, and we are looking to, um, as I said, you know, uh, look at developing the, the programme as a work in progress. Whenever you're talking about the apprenticeships programme, that will obviously be working along with Dale, particularly when we're targeting the, the, the category that people call NEETS, not in education, um, uh, or education, employment or training. So I think, again, you know, we need to be at the stage where it's ready to, to be rolled out and we need to be at the stage where uh, to contact those employers that you're talking about. That's already getting done through um, other departments, particularly Dale. So we're working closely with the Minister and have met with the Minister on this very issue of apprenticeships. So again, that is all a work in progress. As indicated, question two has been withdrawn. I call Mr Sam Gardner. Mr. Deputy Speaker, question number three. Uh, of course, we take careful assessment of what has been said, and we are conscious of any funding that might be withdrawn from the block grant. That said, uh, let me be very clear. We have a clear responsibility to the many thousands of people out there who will be affected by the welfare reform cuts agenda. There was a ministerial subgroup set up to look at the outworking of the welfare reform programme. And the First Minister and I have had a number of discussions in regard to what mitigating measures the Executive might take in order to offset some of the worst aspects of what is likely to be imposed upon us. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and thank the Deputy Minister for answering my question. But could I add, ask a supplementary? Would the Deputy First Minister tell us what outstanding points of dispute uh, within OFM, DFM, or which prevent agreements being reached with the Treasury? And is there a danger that this could be only the first of many disputes of a similar nature, which were indecisions here which led to financial penalties? Well, there have been discussions with the DSD Minister and uh, with Ministers and Representatives from the uh, DWP about what has been proposed in regard to welfare reform. Uh, we have uh, pushed for changes and flexibilities, and we have proposed uh, mitigating uh, measures. All of this has been done for one clear, simple reason. We have, we have a responsibility to protect the most vulnerable members of our society, and we are continuing to explore what changes and flexibilities can be brought about and what further mitigating measures we, as an executive, might be able to take. Our approach is governed by our programme for government uh, commitment, which is to tackle disadvantage and to protect the most vulnerable members of our society. And as the member, and I think many other members well know, we've had uh, a number of contributions to this debate in the course of recent times, not least from NICVA. And I know that there is question marks around the amounts of money which people believe will be withdrawn from our economy as a result of decisions taken 
uh, by a government that uh, the Ulster Unions Party supported in the first place. So I think that uh, that uh, poses, I think, a major responsibility for ourselves in government to continue to explore what more can be done to ensure that we can uh, offset the worst effects on some of the most marginalised and vulnerable people within our society. <coughs> well, Mr. Mickey Brady. I got the last one, I thank the Minister for his answer so far. Could I ask the Minister for, for his assessment of how welfare reform is rolling out in Britain? Goramayagat. Well, I, I'm, I'm sure people are well aware of the interview that uh, Mike Penning uh, gave to uh, uh, the BBC here just a short time ago. And I think in, instead of threatening cuts of five million per month from our block grant, I think Mike Penning would be better at spending his time working out why DWP has already written off 34 million on an IT system that is not fit for purpose. Though departmental estimates suggest that the total figure for write-offs could reach at least 140 million pounds. Uh, the outworking of welfare reform in England has constantly been challenged uh, in the courts and tested in the courts, and DWP uh, has not got it right. So I'm, sure, I'm not sure why people are in such a rush for us to get it wrong as well. And if you want an example, on November the 6th, the Appeal Court in London unanimously quashed the government's decision to close the independent living fund on the grounds that it breached the public sector equality duty. So shortcomings in the work capability assessment uh, have also seen something like 1,000 people die shortly after having been deemed fit for work. So we have to ensure that there is no repeat of private contractors assessing people fit for work only to have them die a short time later. In particular, we need to ensure that this doesn't happen during the transition from DLA to PIPs. Mr. Stephen Agnew. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Deputy First Minister whether an assessment has been made of how much extra each month is coming into the Northern Ireland economy due to the fact we haven't implemented welfare cuts? Well, I think this obviously is one of the biggest issues that we face. And if you look at the, uh, for example, the negotiation of the economic pact that the First Minister and our other ministers were involved in with the British government, if, if you consider the good work that was done in that and the very clear damage that can be done to our economy by a, a welfare cuts agenda, decided by people who, many of whom are millionaires in the, uh, in the British government, people who have no comprehension whatsoever of life in some of the most disadvantaged parts of this country. We have a clear responsibility to uh, in our assessments of how we move forward, do everything in our power as an executive, and I'm sure every member of this assembly would agree with that, to ensure that the funding streams that are available to us are able to deal with the challenges that we face in the time ahead. And we can't take lightly the opinions that are being expressed about the uh, levels of funding that will be withdrawn from our economy as a result of these decisions. So I think that uh, this is big stuff. This is about uh, real people, but it's about some of the most marginalised and disadvantaged within our society. And I think we all have a duty and a responsibility to do everything in our power and examine every option to see how we can take this forward. Dolores Kelly. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Well, so I support uh, the Deputy First Minister not being bounced by threats from Mike Penning. Uh, could the Minister uh, tell us whether or not there is a plan B if these threats do become real in relation to cuts in their budget and how that is going to be managed through the executive? Well, I think it is even uh, too soon to go into that. I think that uh, from, from our perspective, uh, we are dealing with the reality of the here and now and the fact that there have been, I think, useful discussions taking place uh, among uh, members of the executive and uh, quite clearly people are very focused on the challenges uh, that this uh, poses for us. Uh, as I said in my earlier answer in relation to uh, Mike Penning's contribution, which I have to say, in my opinion, was one of the worst interviews I have ever heard from a direct rule minister. Uh, whenever, not alone did he attempt to deal with that issue in a very clumsy way, 
He also ventured into areas of responsibility for this Assembly and this Executive, areas that he had no right to venture into. Call Mr. Robin Newton for question. Question number four, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, during our meetings with senior Chinese government ministers earlier this year, we discussed the potential economic, social, and cultural opportunities which could result from a closer relationship with China. Uh, we were asked to consider opening an office in Beijing to represent the government and to promote our interests in China, and we are advised that this will be be viewed positively by the Chinese government. We anticipate that the development of a closer relationship with China will assist us in accessing markets for our products, in particular agri-food, in lobbying for government support, and in encouraging investors to work with Invest NI and attract greater numbers of students and tourists here. There is already tangible evidence of the benefit of this growing relationship with more local companies than ever securing orders in China attendance of Chinese companies at the recent uh, investment conference, and an invitation from the Chinese government to the Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development to discuss agri-food trade and technology. The Chinese government has also invested in the expansion of the Confucius Network here, and we expect more strategically important announcements in the coming months. Mr. Newton for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. As I understand it, the culture of China actually demands that there are long-term relationships before business is actually done. Could the Deputy First Minister outline to, to the, the Chamber exactly what our strategy is and how long you would think that strategy should be in operation before it delivers tangible business results? Yeah, well, everybody that uh, we speak to in relation to administrations such as the Irish government and the British government do tell us that building relationships with the Chinese uh, comes before anything else. And that's why myself and the First Minister have put such an emphasis on uh, building those relationships. Uh, and it all began, obviously, with a, a very important visit by Deputy Premier Li Yangdong uh, to the North, after which he invited the First Minister and myself to go to China. So we've been there twice. And as a result of our uh, contacts uh, with uh, the authorities in China, uh, we have taken a decision that we're going to open a bureau uh, in China. I think that's a sensible thing to do. It assists us in building those relationships. And quite clearly, the complex nature of Chinese society, particularly Chinese business society, essentially means that in all probability it is a longer term project than, for example, the work that we do in North America with the United States and with uh, Canada. But we are very satisfied at the progress that has been made. Uh, we think that there is uh, uh, very clear opportunities for us to uh, exploit in the time ahead. And during our time in China, we had very useful conversations with Madam Li Yangdong, uh, where she clearly pointed us in the direction of specific areas in China which will benefit from uh, very huge financial investment by the Chinese government, and her suggestion that we consider striking up partnerships with some of those areas. So it's an ongoing work in progress, and the member is absolutely right that building relationships is crucial when you're dealing with the Chinese. Mr. Ian Milne. Eric I'd like uh, to ask the Minister to outline our, trade, our current trade activity with China. Well, Ch China is an important and growing export market for our local companies, many of whom visit China each year with trade delegations which are, are organised by Invest NA. In 2010-2011, we exported almost £112 million pounds worth of goods to China. And that then increased in 2011 2012 to 116 million. Uh, Invest NA has an office in China for many years and is now firmly established in Shanghai. And Shanghai was chosen because it has become China's uh, business capital. Invest NA has contracted three full time advisors who are based in Shanghai and Taiwan. And their role is to provide bespoke research and advice for our companies and to identify market opportunities. Our commitment to China 
is evidenced by Invest's strategy, which includes two trade missions annually to key business centres such as Shanghai and Hong Kong and other developing cities across China. And over the last six years, a total of 350 plus local companies have participated in the trade visit. As a result of this strategy, this market is worth in excess of 110 million in terms of exports by local companies and is sustaining valuable employment here. Best NA has recently recruited a territory manager for the Asia Pacific region to place greater emphasis on trade and foreign direct investment opportunities. And lo our local companies do recognise the huge business potential and emerging opportunities that exist through China's dynamic marketplace. Sandra Overend. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Deputy First Minister for his responses. And, and further to Mr. Newton's question about uh, relationships and building those uh, with China, I wonder could the Deputy First Minister uh, inform the House about uh, how uh, we in Northern Ireland here have been working uh, with the UK Trade and Investment Department in, in building that relationship and how that has benefited Northern Ireland and how that plans to continue? Well, I, I think it's hugely important that we work with everybody, uh, including the body that you just mentioned, and uh, we're consistently seeking advice and support from those who have had experience of working firsthand uh, with the Chinese. And during the course of our uh, visits to China, uh, we have been very ably supported by both the Irish and British ambassadors, and uh, I think that a lot of lessons have been learned by our officials. So it's very important that we work with everybody. We know that there are great opportunities. And in September, our Minister for Agriculture and uh, uh, Rural Development uh, paid a very important visit to China, which opens up uh, prospects in relation to further exports of uh, an agricultural nature from here to China. So I think that, uh, again, it's about relationship building. It's about recognizing the importance of going there. And I think we all have learned uh, from our experiences, particularly in North America, that if you don't go, you don't count. And it is absolutely vital that our ministers are traveling the length and breadth of the planet to uh, seek whatever uh, investment that we can get to provide jobs for people here. And that's why you know, our Minister for Enterprise, Trade and Investment has been traveling probably uh, more than most. And I think the benefits have now been seen because we clearly see over the course of the last couple of years that we have managed to attract more foreign direct investment in the last three or four years than at any other time in the history of the state. And to do that against the backdrop of a world economic crisis, I have to say, is some achievement. Mr David McNary. Speaker, uh, just to ask the Deputy First Minister, are there any positive signs of uh, students from China coming here to Northern Ireland to study? Well, the short answer to that is that they're already here, and they're here in huge numbers at the uh, Queen's University uh, and uh, the University of Ulster. And of course, the uh, Confucius Institute is an institute that we have built up very important relationships with uh, over the course of our last visit to China. And, uh, Madam Li Yang Dong actually attended an event at the uh, University of Ulster at Jordanstown, which the First Minister and I uh, also participated in. So, quite clearly, attracting students from China is very, very important. Language is very important because I think increasingly people recognise that English is, you know, uh, an absolute prerequisite for people involved in foreign uh, direct investment and trade. So, I think that. Uh, Given the level of contact that we have now with the authorities in China, and in fact, when the First Minister and I were there, we actually met with the Chinese Minister for Education, as well as many other influential figures. This is undoubtedly something that can be built upon, and the member is absolutely right. It's, it's crucial that we continue to attract uh, foreign students, not just from China, but China is obviously a huge uh, population, presenting huge opportunities for us. <coughs> Mr. David Heldridge for a question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question five. 
Uh, the First Minister and I travelled to Boston and Chicago between the 21st and 25th of October to undertake a number of engagements to promote the local business message and build on the success of the economic conference which took place on the 10th and 11th of October. Our five-day visit was a great opportunity to reinforce our bonds with existing and potential investors in the United States uh, to promote uh, our region as an attractive investment location and to promote connected healthcare and university collaboration. Our attendance at a major EU-US connected health conference in Boston, attended by an international audience from over 20 countries, provided a platform to showcase our growing expertise in the connected health uh, arena. Uh, we were pleased to have the support of our colleague, the Minister of Health, Social Services and Public Safety, who also spoke at the conference. And we also pushed the wider research and development agenda by supporting the work of the two local universities in the area of collaborative clinical research by meeting with US universities who have established links with Queen's and the University of Ulster. In Boston, we addressed an audience of 170 senior business executives on the benefits of doing business here. In Chicago and Peoria, we visited uh, Chicago Mercantile Exchange and Caterpillar. These are two of our most important American investors. And we played an instrumental role in helping Chicago Mercantile Exchange make its decision to invest during an earlier visit to the city. The visit to Caterpillar allowed us to meet with the company's top management team and to reiterate the executive support for consolidating relationships with existing investors. And while we were there, we were particularly pleased to announce a further £7 million investment by Caterpillar to expand its manufacturing business here. So this reinforces our position as an investment location for global companies. Uh, they are an important investment, uh, investor, not just in terms of jobs and wealth creation, but also in the credibility as presence lends to doing uh, business here. Call Mr. Hildage for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and thank the Deputy First Minister for his answer. Being from a constituency that has benefited from the recent trade visit, and we are thankful for that and the confidence Caterpillar has shown in that workforce, can the Deputy First Minister assure the House that we are at the top of our game and that the right and best structures in place to maximise uh, on our trade links with the United States in between these visits? Well, I think there's no question or doubt about it whatsoever that we are performing well in excess of any other region in these islands. And I think that uh, a lot of the work that has been done by our representatives in the United States and by Invest NI, coupled with the important investment conferences that we've all participated in, and whenever you get very senior executives from very uh, prominent world brands coming to the investment conference and actually making the argument for us with other potential investors, I think it's then that you clearly know that you're going places. It's one thing the First Minister and I go into the United States and making grandiose speeches and statements about what we have to offer. The best people to promote what we are doing here in terms of FDA and the success of companies who have invested here is to get those companies that have invested and have reinvested to actually articulate to a wider audience the benefits of doing business here. And that's principally why we're seeing such an increase in foreign direct investment in the course of recent times, particularly from the United States and from North America. Call Mr. Sean Lynch. From my I can't call you. I'm going with a station error as in Fraglishin. Can I ask the Minister or can he tell us of any future investment trips? From my good. Very briefly, Minister. Well, this has been a very busy year for the First Minister and myself, and that's because we place great importance on uh, our position to promote the economy by engaging face to face with existing and potential investors. We think the level of contact has paid huge dividends in the past, so we're committed to taking that forward. And the evidence is there to prove it. You know, the HBO decision to use the paint hall as far back as uh, 2009, and they're still here with something like 800 people uh, employed. Meeting with financial giants like the New York Stock Exchange, Chicago Mercantile, uh, and others, bringing them over the line bringing about the securing of the devolution of air passenger duty to the Assembly after engaging with the CEO of United Airlines. All of these uh, outcomes uh, only happened because we went. They couldn't have taken place if we were behind 
a desk in Belfast. Uh, the last couple of years we've travelled to Brazil and there in the Middle East and made very successful visits to the US and also to China. At the invitation of the Japanese Prime Minister, whom we met during the G8 summit, we've been invited to visit uh, Japan, uh, and that, that will happen in the next very short while. So I reiterate once again, these visits present a very significant time commitment from the First Minister and myself, but we know the value of them, and I think the evidence is there to prove it. Order. That ends the period for oral questions. We will now move on to topical questions, and I call Mr Sam Gardner. Mr Gardner. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Question number one. Oh, sorry. My apologies. Uh, could I ask the Deputy First Minister, if he's taken the questions, to confirm that the issue being dealt with by Dr Haas are at stand one issues? Well, the issues being dealt with by Dr Haas are very clearly on the public record. Uh, they, they are about dealing with the issue of parades, flags and the past. And uh, whatever strand people want to put them in, there's of no relevance to me, uh, or I think should be of any relevance to anybody else. These are issues that affect us here in the context of the here and now. And they come about as a result of uh, what has been, I think, a very damaging year where we clearly have seen uh, elements like the Ulster Volunteer Force and elements of the Orange Order in North Belfast and in other parts of Belfast fomenting conflict on the streets. And it's conflict that has to be unreservedly condemned alongside the activities of so-called uh, uh, Republican uh, groups who have no support in the community and who, in the course of this week, have been involved in trying to create mayhem on the streets. Uh, well, the answer to all of them is that it isn't going to work. Yes, we need solutions to parades, we need solutions to flags, and we need a solution to the past. And uh, I think that it's incumbent upon all of us to do everything in our power to try and find solutions to these problems. Because if we don't find solutions to the problems, all we do is leave openings for those who wish to exploit uh, their agenda, which is clearly an anti-assembly agenda, it's an anti-executive agenda, it's an anti-peace process agenda. So I think what we have to do is that we have to uh, do our jobs as politicians, come up with results, whilst at the same time giving our wholehearted support to the police as they combat uh, the lawbreakers. Comes to Gardner for supplementary. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and thank the Deputy First Minister for his answer. But can the Deputy First Minister confirm that the Dublin government will not be involved in the Haas processes? Well, I, I think Richard Haas, during the course of his stewardship of, of the process, and remember he was uh, charged with the responsibility to do this job by the five major parties in this uh, assembly. Uh, we were the people collectively, against all odds, agreed who the independent chair would be. And as a result of the responsibilities that he has been given, uh, he finds himself having to speak, obviously, to the, uh, the panel that has been established here, representing the five uh, main parties, but also to the British government and to the Irish government. Uh, and I think that uh, there's very few people in this House that would expect that he would uh, you know, move forward with what is a very onerous task against the backdrop of not speaking to both the Irish government and the uh, British government. As well as that, I think we're all very conscious that the White House has taken a very keen interest in this. Uh, Richard Haas has met with the highest level uh, of the administration. He's met with Joe Biden. Myself and the First Minister both took phone calls from the Vice President, and they are retaining a very keen interest in this. So, there's a lot of interest in what is happening, uh, and it's, I think, very appropriate that both the US administration, the Irish government and the British government uh, have their say in relation to all of it. At the end of the day, the decision-making process will be one uh, of huge responsibility for the parties in this assembly. I call Mr Thomas Buchanan for topical Mr. questions. Deputy Speaker, and perhaps I should declare, and I've just been a member of the Orange Order, which I'm proud of. Would the Deputy yeah. First Minister agree with me that it is now time for all those involved in terrorist and criminal activity to come clean about their past? 
Well, the past has been dealt with in the context of the, ha the Haas talks, and uh, it, it's an element that obviously uh, creates uh, a lot of pain for people who were victims during the course of the conflict. Uh, and of course, we have seen in recent uh, television programmes, uh, not least being the latest programme uh, done by Panorama, uh, that uh, there's no moral high ground. I think for anybody in relation to all of this. I mean, there are many people, there are many people in this House who supported uh, these activities. Uh, there are many people uh, in opposite benches who supported uh, these groups and these activities. And I think that uh, what we have to do is recognise that the reason that we're in the situation that we're in today is because we have seen conflict on the streets over the course of the last year. Uh, we have seen an agenda headed up by a paramilitary organisation, the Ulster Volunteer Force, people that I, that I have challenged both publicly and privately about their activities. And what we need to do is get a resolution to the challenges uh, posed not just by the UVF, but these so-called Republican groups who uh, are living in Cloud Cookie Land who are living a little, a little cocoon, totally detached from the reality of where people's lives are. And in relation to how we deal with the, the past, our, as, as John Dunlop, I think, rightly put it on Sunday sequence last Sunday, how we cope with the past. That does represent a real challenge, but it doesn't just represent a challenge, folks, for Republicans. It represents a challenge for everybody, including the British government. Order before calling Mr. Buchanan for a supplementary. I have to remind members, please, no shouting from a sedentary position. I just will not tolerate it. Continue. Okay, can I, uh, again, on following on, can I ask the, the Deputy First Minister, does he believe that his party leader, Gerry Adams, was not a member of the IRA, despite all the evidence uh, from other witnesses to the contrary? Well, I'm, I'm on uh, the public record that I was a member of the IRA. It didn't do me any harm getting elected in Mid-Ulster. The people of South Derry and East Tyrone, whenever they made a decision to make me their MP in 1997, did so because they believed I was absolutely committed to building the peace process, because they wanted peace, and they saw my contribution to that as being an important contribution. I hope I've made an important contribution. And I think those people who uh, make the argument that you can't further contribute to society in a meaningful way because you were a member of the IRA in the past are making a huge mistake. They're making a huge mistake. Uh, it's irrelevant. That's totally irrelevant. We have, in my opinion, in my opinion, in my opinion, Father Alec Reid, who died recently, made a massive contribution to peace in this country. Gerry Adams made a massive contribution to peace in this country. And working with John Hume, John Hume made a massive contribution to peace in this country. Sometimes, sometimes, sometimes it's probably now and again worth asking the question from some of the most negative elements who try to use these situations against the peace process, what contribution have they made? Call Mr Mitchell McLaughlin for a topical question. Thank you. Um, can I uh, ask the Deputy First Minister uh, for, his, uh, for an update in regard to the soft market testing of Shackleton Barracks? Well, the, the soft market testing exercise commenced on the 18th of November, and this will be of great interest to the uh, Deputy Speaker. And it will be completed by the end of January 2014. After the level of interest is determined, a, a decision will be taken as to the suitability to go forward with uh, development plans. Officials have, on an ongoing basis, met with local landowners, the local council, and community groups to inform them of the position in relation to the site and to listen to their views. It would be the intention uh, to continue with this dialogue as we move forward. 
So all parties have expressed an interest in the Shackleton Barrack site to OFM, DFM or BTW Shields, including local farmers and resident groups. They were sent details of the expressions of interest process on Thursday, the 14th of uh, November. Call Mr. McLaughlin for supplementary. And, and given what uh, some might see, uh, and I thank the Deputy First Minister for that update, given what some might uh, perceive as a conflict uh, of interest between, say, local entrepreneurial interests and uh, the stated intention of the Minister for Agriculture and Rural Development to decentralise her department, uh, can the, uh, the Deputy First Minister indicate whether uh, he believes both sets of ambitions can be accommodated on this site? Well, I think the, the simple answer to, to the member's question is absolutely yes. Uh, we recognise that value for the site is not just monetary but economic and social. And while continuing to uh, explore sale of the site, we've not lost sight of the other local needs. Now, let me also point out that one of the greatest needs in the North West is for employment and decentralisation of the Department of Agriculture and Rural Development headquarters, and that has the potential to create not just employment, but also be part of the local uh, economic regeneration of the area. And I think given those two positions, I believe that the further development of the Shackleton site offers great potential for all concerned. Uh, th this is a site that I am increasingly excited about, and I think the decision by DARD, supported by the executive, to relocate to uh, Shackleton Barracks has created a focus for other interests. And we are now getting very serious expressions of interest. This is an absolutely massive site, which I think can cater for the needs of not just DARD, but other uh, interests, including the interests of the local community. Call Mr. Basil McCrae for a topical question. Thank you, Deputy uh, Speaker. Uh, would the uh, First and Deputy First Minister's Office support the devolving of more economic powers to the Northern Ireland Assembly, given that Westminster is currently considering this for other regional assemblies? Well, I, I think that uh, one of the most um, important powers that we're seeking, which the member and other members will be well aware of, is the power to devolve uh, corporation tax, uh, which we estimate if we can get that, particularly against the background of the very positive answers I've given on foreign direct investment in the course of this question and answer session uh, could lead to the creation of a further uh, something like 58,000 new jobs. So that is absolutely crucial for us and uh, we think we're making progress. Obviously the British Prime Minister has decided that he won't make a decision on this until such times as the Scottish uh, referendum is out of the way. And I think there will be various opinions in the Assembly about uh, further powers. Some parties here are for a lot of new powers to be given to the Assembly. Others, I think, have concerns. And some of the concerns might be political as well as not just financial. And I think all of this, I think, can be resolved through a process of dialogue and discussion and agreement between us. Uh, the key job of work to be done in the next very short while is obviously corporation tax. And uh, if, we can, if we can achieve that one, it will be a massive step forward for us in terms of our administration. Mr. McCrae for supplementary. Um, further to that answer, Minister, uh, would you support the creation of a commission on devolution similar to the Silk Commission? to investigate the possibility of devolving more powers to see what would be advantageous and what would not be advantageous and what could command support? Well, I think the member and all members know that uh, question time to the Office of First and Deputy First Minister, uh, I'm answering as best I can, as I know the First Minister does whenever he's asked questions. We try to answer for the both of us. So I think that uh, from my perspective, uh, that's certainly something that can be considered. Uh, I, I wouldn't be opposed to it, but I would like to come to uh, a position on that in the aftermath of having a, a discussion with the, uh, the First Minister and ultimately, if we were to proceed along that route uh, with other members of the Executive to get their agreement. <coughs> Call Mr Alban McGuinness for topical questions. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, Given the fact that there will be a march on Saturday, 
in the centre of Belfast, which again will disrupt business, etc. Uh, would the uh, Deputy First Minister agree with me that these people have made their point in relation to flags and they should desist from future demonstrations and, if possible, enter into the Haas process where they could make their points more effectively? Well, I absolutely agree that it's, it's a responsibility of everybody involved in this to recognise the importance of discussion and dialogue. I do think people have made their point, and I note with interest that the media are now exercised about who is actually organising the parade on Saturday. Uh, I don't have any doubt as to who's organising this parade. This parade has been organised by the UVA and has been supported by elements within uh, the Orange Order. And I think there, there clearly is a responsibility on the Progressive uh, Unionist Party, as they call themselves, to recognise the damage uh, that can be done if uh, these protests continue. Yes, I think people have made their point. But the main point to be made is that they have uh, a duty to face up to the concerns being expressed on a consistent basis by the business community in Belfast about how damaging uh, these protests can be. Now, I come from a society that uh, believes people have the right to protest. But in protesting, people have to take decisions as to whether or not that protest is going to contribute to a resolution or an exacerbation of the problem. And I think ongoing protests of this nature, particularly if the main people behind them uh, are the likes of the UVF, are very worrying indeed. Order. Uh, time is up.